Tonight, tourists are killed when a New Zealand volcano erupts. Dramatic pictures from someone who got out just in time. There was no warning, but were there signs? New rules for your phone company to combat those scam callers. Russia banned from international sports, why some say it isn't enough. And Canada's Athlete of the Year, Bianca Andrescu caps off her season of firsts. My next goal would be... Find out what's next. She's talking to us. This is The National. We now know how many people are believed to have been killed or injured in that volcanic eruption in New Zealand, but not yet who they are. And tonight, there's another big question. Why was anyone allowed so close to such a dangerous place? It's been just over 24 hours since the blast happened as people toured the site. At least five are confirmed killed. Another eight are missing and feared dead. They were touring this crater on White Island off the coast of New Zealand's North Island when the eruption happened. As Tanya Fletcher tells us, that's when fear quickly turned into action. A moment of terror for tourists watching from the water, while those on the ground were trapped. No signs of life have been seen at any point. 47 people were on White Island when it erupted yesterday, spewing white ash three and a half kilometers into the blue sky. Small boats rushed over to help the survivors. Nearby helicopters were mobilized in an instant. Crews were able to rescue 34 people right away. When we got there, uh, it was it was quite a um, uh, quite an, a, an experience. It was it was like um, like I've seen the the Chernobyl um, miniseries, and it there was just everything was just blanketed in ash. Many of the survivors suffered severe blast injuries and serious burns. Officials are now waiting for the danger to subside before searching the island for those who didn't make it off. We will only go to the island when it is safe to do so for our people. Images now show the island blanketed with volcanic ash. Many of those who were there at the time were cruise ship passengers. Among the injured and dead are people from six countries, including Australia. There are 11 Australians that are still unaccounted for. None of the victims are Canadian, but a cruise ship passenger from Toronto witnessed the eruption from a distance. It was a volcano erupting. It just looked like smokestacks. White Island draws tens of thousands of tourists each year, but a volcano scientist based in the U.S. had refused to work there because he believed it was too dangerous. All of the island is the, the crater of a volcano that's a fairly active volcano, one of the most active in New Zealand, and part of it was that as a volcanologist, I, I felt like it was sort of my duty to, to not feel like I should support uh, tour, tour operations that are going to potentially put people in danger like that. Today, the mainland port is quiet, except for a growing memorial of flowers in honor of those who didn't return. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. You heard a bit there from Canadian Sylvain Placé about seeing the eruption from afar. He also described what it was like to learn many on the island were his fellow cruise ship passengers. Here he is again. And one of the locals tells me, wow, you're lucky you get to witness the eruption of the volcano. And when I got back on the ship, I found out that many passengers from the cruise ship, as well as crew members who, with whom I'm very friends with, have been on the tour. And uh, hearing the captain's announcement was just, my, my stomach just dropped to the floor. There was a couple last night that I talked to in the concierge lounge. They're on their honeymoon. And they said that every single port that we're doing on this cruise, they were doing an excursion, and I didn't see them tonight. It makes you really shaky. It makes you realize that, you know, how fragile we are. So the big questions coming out of all of this, how did no one know that volcano was about to erupt? Salima Shivji, with why experts say making that call isn't easy. Mere minutes before the violent eruption, White Island's crater was churning and active. The minutes after, a 12,000-meter plume captured by New Zealand's Volcano Monitoring Agency. It was almost like a throat-clearing kind of eruption. On the scheme of things, 
for volcanic eruptions, it's not large, but if you are close to that, it is, it is not good. A minor burst made up mostly of steam, unlike the much larger deadly plume that erupted from Mount St. Helens nearly 40 years ago, or the continuous lava spewing from Hawaii's Kilauea. That's why experts say it was hard to read any warning signs, even though this volcano is never resting and every change is tracked. A flurry of activity last month raised the alert level from one to two out of a possible five, but that didn't halt any tours. Each volcano has its own personality. They're distinct entities. This volcanologist says predicting an eruption is a science that works half in the dark. It's not often that you get to see underneath the bottom of a glacier. Glenn Williams-Jones has peered into the mouths of volcanoes like British Columbia's Mount Meagre, studying movement deep down that's often too subtle. Those signals are very, very difficult to tease out from just background noise. So there's a lot of research that goes into trying to understand, is it building up or it's just breathing and it's doing its thing and everything's safe. For White Island, it's a balancing act. This active volcano has been a tourist destination for decades. If you're a tourist and you're visiting a natural setting like this, this is not Disneyland. This is a real world, things can change. Unfortunately, in this case, for the worse, without much warning. As New Zealand grapples with the aftermath, its prime minister says tough questions will be debated later, whether tourists should still be allowed up to the edge of a capricious volcano. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Vancouver. And the danger may not be over yet. The volcanic alert level for White Island is at level three right now. And New Zealand's geological agency says there's a chance of a smaller or even similar sized eruption in the next day or so. Here at home, the Liberals hope to open Parliament with a popular policy move, proposing to raise the basic personal amount exemption by almost $2,000, meaning the first $15,000 earned would be tax-free. David Cochran has the story as MPs return for their first full week of work. It's the first order of Liberal business and one of the first confidence votes for this new Parliament. We were very clear in the campaign that we wanted to reduce taxes. A modest tax break for about 20 million Canadians, a low-drama proposal and a no-drama confidence vote. Uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what the, the NDP is. wouldn't say if they'd support the tax cut. On va pas faire de l'opposition pour opposer. But the Bloc Québécois leader says he will. So the government won't fall, Oral questions. Kiss. though the Conservatives won't stop trying. Government spending is out of control. Canada's debt is ballooning. As the government cuts taxes, the economy sheds jobs, losing more than 70,000 last month. It's this Prime Minister who's actively working to constrain Canada's economy. And this approach has left Canada on the brink of a recession. The very first thing we're doing today uh, is announcing that we will be lowering taxes, as promised, for tens of millions of Canadians, uh, lifting 40,000 people out of poverty, making sure that hundreds of thousands of Canadians no longer have to pay any income taxes. This is help for Canadians at a time when they need it. So the pressure continued inside the House and outside, with the Premier of Alberta giving a speech just down the road from Parliament Hill, pushing for changes to federal policy. Alberta has been the goose that laid the golden egg in the modern Canadian economy and for our system of fiscal federalism. But our ability to continue playing that nation-building role is in real jeopardy today. So tomorrow, Jason Kenney expected to meet with the PM, Dave, and it's, I think it's probably fair to say that this isn't going to be like Trudeau's other meetings with other premiers. Yeah, those have been a very small, low-key affairs, small delegations, short meetings with lots of common grounds, a different approach being taken by Jason Kenney. Rosie, he's brought one-third of his cabinet with him to Ottawa. This is a diplomatic mission from Alberta to Ottawa, and, and they've been either been meeting or will be meeting with their counterparts at the federal level. So while Kenney's speech today and his meeting with the Prime Minister or tomorrow, sort of the headline events of this visit. There's a lot of things happening behind the scenes as Alberta and Ottawa try to work things out. All right, we'll be watching. Thanks, David. Appreciate it. Sure. Meanwhile, it looks like the long quest to get a new NAFTA deal is now almost over. Es el momento de tomar ya la decisión. 
Mexico's president says now is the time to conclude a deal. Christia Freeland is on her way to Mexico, as are the U.S. Trade Representative and White House advisor Jared Kushner. Recent U.S. changes on labor and environmental standards have been well received. Sources telling CBC that barring something unexpected, a revised deal could be signed tomorrow to then be ready for ratification by each country. Canada's telecom regulator has announced measures to counter call spoofing. That's where a fake phone number shows up in your call display. By next September, your provider has to install equipment to show that the call you're answering is actually coming from where it says it's coming from. Thomas Degla shows us how it's going to work. Nicole Gombe worries about answering her phone these days, bothered by scam calls when she's at home, and annoyed by the fraudsters even when she's away. The more annoying thing has been when my telephone number is taken over by scammers. So it's not that they call me, but that they use my number to call other people. It's a common problem. A real number shows up on caller ID, but it's been spoofed by scammers. Across Canada, people have been receiving calls purporting to be from the Federal Revenue Agency or the police. Sophisticated scams that the CRTC hopes to root out with new technology next September. This is just another level of protection to Canadians to reduce the amount of spoofed calls. The protocol is known as stir shaken. When a call is placed, it will go through an authentication service, which is then verified by the recipient's service provider. The system should confirm whether the number is legitimate. So as the phone rings, it could display a message like this one that says the caller is verified or not. Is it conceivable for the telcos within Canada to have this next year? Absolutely. This cybersecurity consultant has seen the technology at work in the U.S. and points to one big challenge. Scams often originate from call centers overseas. It really won't be until all of the countries come online with their, their own implementations of this that we'll really start to see the problem eradicated. Plus, the trick only works for newer generation IP network devices, unlike Nicole Gombe's home phone. In the meantime, she has a lower tech solution for scammers. I tell them they should be ashamed of themselves. Um, and otherwise I hang up. For some users, it will at least be easier to decide which calls to decline. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. The National Hockey League has responded tonight to the case of former Calgary Flames coach Bill Peters and the concerns his story raised about the treatment of players by coaches. Inappropriate conduct engaged in by club personnel will be disciplined either by the team, the league, or both. While discipline, as always, must be on a case-by-case -case basis, it is my intention that it must be severe and appropriate and designed to remedy the situation and ensure that the conduct does not occur again. Gary Bettman went on to say the league will create a broad-based education program. He also said there will be zero tolerance for abusive behavior or for any team that doesn't immediately report allegations of it. Bettman said that he believes most coaches act professionally, and he mentioned that he has met with Akeem Alou, the former player whose allegation revealed the problem. Team Russia is banned from the Olympics and World Cup for the next four years. So Russian athletes will have to compete independently if they can prove they're clean. As Chris Brown tells us, the World Anti-Doping Agency says the ban is deliberately designed to send a message to Russian authorities. When they picked up their gold medals in Rio in 2016, little did these Russian gymnasts know it might be another eight years before their country's anthem is again played in an Olympics. Punishment, says WADA, because it believes Russia continues to cheat. Russia was afforded every opportunity to get its house in order and to rejoin the global anti-doping community for the good of its athletes and for the integrity of sport. But it chose instead a different route. WADA claims thousands of samples from the supposedly sealed off Moscow drug testing lab were tampered with to conceal which athletes were dirty. A complete ban. Canadian skier and anti-doping crusader Becky Scott says the damage to the sport is permanent. We may never know the names of those athletes. We will never know um, if they're still competing. In Russia, where state media has always portrayed the doping scandal as part of a Western plot, the reaction was predictable.
все решения повторяются. Russia plans to fight back with an appeal and its Olympic Committee is vowing somehow it will get Russia's flag and anthem into competitions. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. Now, Russia is in other news tonight concerning its links to Donald Trump's 2016 presidential campaign. Trump's always called it a witch hunt. A new report, though, says otherwise. The U.S. Justice Department Inspector General reviewed the FBI probe that later became the Mueller investigation. His report found serious errors, even misconduct, in the handling of some wiretap applications. But overall, he found the investigation was opened for sufficient reasons, found no evidence it was influenced by political bias, and no evidence it placed a spy in Trump's campaign. In other words, he didn't find a witch hunt. Trump's take today was the opposite of that. The details of the report are far worse than anything I would have even imagined. This was an overthrow of government. This was an attempted overthrow. The inspector general is scheduled to appear before Congress on his report on Wednesday. But today, the Judiciary Committee of the Congress chewed over other reports, the findings from both Democrats and Republicans on the impeachment inquiry. Susan Ormiston was in the room during a grueling day of facts and attacks. Just minutes in, a protester sets the stage for a combative day. We voted for Donald Trump, and they're simply removing him because they don't like him. Accusing the Democratic chair of treason as he was hustled out. Republicans picked up the theme of a predetermined plot. All this is about is about a clock and a calendar because they can't get over the fact Donald Trump is president of the United States and they don't have a candidate that they think can beat him. Mostly, this was lawyers stitching together three weeks of witnesses and testimony into a case. Republican counsel Stephen Castor arrived with his briefing papers in a grocery bag. His job to sow doubt. The substantive case for impeaching President Trump relies heavily on ambiguous facts, presumptions, and speculation. Democrats pounded away at Trump's abuse of presidential power. He did it intentionally. He did it corruptly. He abused his powers in ways that the founders feared the most. Multiple times, the hearing simply devolved into a political brawl. Mr. Chairman, what is this? Gentlemen, is not recognized. Republicans interrupting on points of order. We're going to ignore the rules. We are not our witnesses to ask the questions. It's just wrong. You see what's happening there today. Uh, the president has no alibi. Uh, the GOP has no legal theory. Uh, against high crimes and misdemeanors, and so they're just pounding the table and complaining about process. Over, Over nearly 10 hours, the chair struggled to keep control to the as the order. next phase of impeachment was churning away under the fog on Capitol Hill. So tonight we know those articles of impeachment are being finalized. There are multiple charges, I'm told, including abuse of power and some kind of obstruction. We could see them this week. It's moving fast. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Washington. More news ahead tonight, including a new survey on the reality of racism in this country. And Bianca Andreescu makes history again. We sit down with Canada's Athlete of the Year, plus a fiery train derailment in Saskatchewan. You'll hear from a witness. We are back in just two minutes. When it comes to racism in Canada, there are no easy answers, no quick fixes, and according to a new report, a lot of sometimes conflicting truths. In a new survey of more than 3,000 Canadians, older than 18 and from all sorts of backgrounds, 7 in 10 believe race relations in this country are generally good. At the same time, it revealed a widespread recognition that racism is a reality in Canada. 
One aspect of that is known as microaggression, more subtle, but as Kayla Hounsel explains, just as harmful. Let's stop the violence. Stop the violence. Quintrell Provo started his campaign of compassion after losing his cousin to violence. You guys are going to spread the message of love? Yeah. But even as Provo works to stop the violence, he continues to experience racism. You know, I remember when we had three deaths in six days here in Nova Scotia, um, and I would get messages on Facebook saying that we don't have a gun problem, we have a black problem, we just have to get rid of all the black people. 54% of black Canadians surveyed said they personally experience unfair treatment because of their race regularly or from time to time. 53% of indigenous people agree. The study also shows Canadians experience what's known as microaggressions or modern racism. I've been willing to give up my seat and they just look at me like I'm going to bite them or something and I'm like, people don't know how that feels. Microaggressions can include everything from being mistaken for someone who serves others, being treated suspiciously, denied service or being treated as though you're not smart. I was a person I would always, I would do my homework, I would always get my stuff done. Um, and, and, but people would say, like, man, like, why are you acting white? This women's studies professor says indigenous people have similar experiences. In a um, store, retail store, or being able to find an apartment because of your last name. The study actually validates what, what people have been saying all along from racialized communities, from indigenous peoples, that racism that they experienced are actually quite prevalent. The study shows Canadians overall are optimistic racial equality will happen within their lifetime. Black people, less so. I'm tired of it and, and things, need, things need to change. They, they need to. Some are optimistic, however cautiously. I'm praying for a brighter day. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Among the other stories we are following tonight, crews continue cleanup efforts in Saskatchewan after a train derailment sparked a massive fire overnight. Well, I jumped up, went and looked out my window and all I could see was flames and crazy smoke and I thought her whole place was on fire. Some amazing video coming out today after the fiery derailment of a CP freight train carrying crude oil southeast of Saskatoon. No injuries have been reported, but heavy smoke from the blaze did shut down a nearby highway, as you can see there. A hazmat team has been deployed to assist with the cleanup. Investigators from the Transportation Safety Board are now looking into the incident. Hazmat crews were also called to action just north of Toronto today after a large fire ripped through an industrial plant and forced the evacuations of nearby homes and businesses. Officials say they are looking into possible chemicals, dangerous chemicals, inside that building. It's unclear when people will be able to return to their homes. There have been no reports of any injuries there either. In British Columbia, two RCMP officers have been found not negligent in the overdose death of a teen that went viral. Carson Crimeni died in August after an incident that was filmed and then shared on social media. Nearly three hours passed between the first 911 call about a Snapchat photo showing the 14-year-old in distress at a skate park and a second call about the teen being found about 650 meters away. Officers spent 20 minutes searching the skate park that night but left after there were no signs of Carson. A report by BC's police watchdog says the officers acted completely reasonably under the circumstances. Tomorrow they shut down, then I have to take a car in to, <laughs> to downtown and that takes twice as long. Thousands of commuters in Metro Vancouver are bracing for a SkyTrain shutdown as talks drag on between the BC Rapid Transit Company and the union representing some 900 workers. If no deal is reached, a three-day shutdown would begin tomorrow for two major lines on the region's core transit system. It moves about 150,000 people per day. Time for a quick break, but up next, another breakthrough for Bianca Andrescu, the first tennis star to be named Canada's top athlete. And later, a look at electric vehicles in Canada. Drivers say they're ready to make the shift, but are automakers and the dealers.
Her first big victory of the year came in March, the next just months later in Toronto, but that paled in comparison to Bianca Andreescu's biggest win of all a month later. Now, the Canadian tennis star has capped off her incredible year with another award, the 2019 Lou Marsh Trophy for being Canada's Athlete of the Year. Hard to argue with that. So much in such a short time. CBC Sports' Devin Haru sat down with Andrescu after today's announcement to look back and ahead. What were you doing a year ago right now? <laughs> I was playing a 25K in Kansas, and I was ranked like 175 in the world. Hard to fathom that in just one short year, Bianca Andrescu has gone from tennis obscurity to Canadian sports stardom, a journey marked by three improbable wins. I, I was definitely not in the best headspace um, because I didn't feel like I was improving much. And at that time, I was also injured uh, with my back. She says she needed a spark, and in March, she got it. The fourth ever youngest winner, the first ever wild card winner. I think that's one of the best moments of my career, actually. The first win. Yeah, the first win. You never forget Sweetest it, Sweetest victory, definitely. Then, almost immediately, a setback. Another injury sidelined her for months. But back she came to face her idol in a hometown Rogers Cup final. I started bawling before the match because so many emotions were going through my head. But for all the build-up, the match was anticlimactic. Yeah, we've got a problem. This here. time, a Williams injury ended it, leading to this unforgettable moment. <laughs> that set the stage for a historic showdown in New York. The U.S. Open title this time on Serena's turf. It was crazy that's in there. Right. It was crazy. <laughs> I think you plugged your ears at one point. I did. Uh, that's when she was having her comeback. People just were probably praying for a third set or something. That third set never came and rescue ripping this forehand winner <laughs> to become the first Canadian singles player to win a Grand Slam title. And you're laying there. What are you thinking about? All I was thinking about was all those tough times that I've been through and just realizing how, how much dedication and hard work I put into the sport and how all those times are worth it, really. Something she's ready to experience over and over in a career that's just getting started. My next goal would be to visualize the Australian Open trophy and becoming number one in the world by the end of next year. I think it's, I think it's definitely possible if I stay healthy. That's the goal. Yep. Heard it here first. <laughs> Devin Haru, CBC News, Toronto. I love her. She's so full of confidence. We'll be right back with more news on The National. If electric vehicles are so great, why aren't they just everywhere? We'll look at the challenges of going green. And later, an avalanche caught on camera. The story behind this incredibly close call in tonight's moment. Welcome back. Here are some of the other stories we are following tonight on The National. For the first time, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has met with Russian President Vladimir Putin for peace talks. The talks were hosted in Paris, with the French and German leaders also in attendance. This marks the first time in some three years that efforts have been made to stop the war that has cost 13,000 lives. The two sides reportedly agreed on a swap of prisoners today. What words would you use to describe that factory at that point? Dangerous. Um unnecessary, taking unnecessary risk, chaotic, uh, uh, disarray. A former Boeing manager says he warned the company of problems at its main factory before the now infamous 737 MAX crashes. In an interview with NBC News, Ed Pearson says the Washington State factory where the plane is produced was riddled with production problems and potentially unsafe. He is set to appear before Congress on Wednesday. 
Volkswagen is now facing charges in Canada for the emissions scandal four years after the company admitted to installing software to trick emissions testing equipment. The German automaker faces 58 charges for violating the Canadian Environmental Protection Act between 2008 and 2015. In the United States, the company was fined $4.3 billion U.S. after pleading guilty to similar charges more than two years ago. Now, Volkswagen is just one of many car companies making big promises about electric vehicles, and that's a world the National is exploring a whole lot more of. With growth in the technology and charging infrastructure, batteries are getting better, ranges longer, and cross-country trips even more possible. So if electric vehicles are so great, why aren't they everywhere? David Common has the answer. <laughs> These are the converts, drivers who've gone electric and never plan to go back. They're quiet, they're quick, it's also a better drive. What's the t-shirt say? It says, I miss gas stations, said no EV owner ever. <laughs> you do. You own an EV, you own an EV? The Leaf. The Leaf. They're preaching to the curious, busting myths along the way. I mean, once you drive one of those, you don't feel the difference and uh, you enjoy the difference. Can it go as far as you need it? My husband is there in the white shirt. Yep. We kind of nicknamed him High Mileage Rob. We put uh, just over 100,000 kilometers on that car in first year of ownership. Should we go meet High Mileage Rob? We hear you have a nickname. <laughs> I should be about the highest mileage uh, Model 3 in Canada. What about cost? It's cheaper to operate on gasoline. And cheaper on maintenance as well. I actually saving $200 a month. This thing is one-tenth the cost. Are there enough charging stations? There's really no real gaps, except maybe in the Midwest, and those chargers are coming on live, you know, this year. Hang out here much longer at Canada's largest electric vehicle gathering, and even the skeptical might find themselves convinced. We can produce our own electricity, and yeah. you can't produce your own gasoline. But there's a problem. Want to buy? It's not always so easy to find an EV. Can you go to any dealership and get them? No, usually they don't have them at the dealerships. It's something you got to request. How long did you have to wait for it? Five months. It's just unfortunate there's not, not enough supply to supply the demand that there is for them. Right now, of Canada's 25 million vehicles, 136,000 of them are electric. But 54% of Canadians polled say they're inclined to buy electric for their next vehicle. 10% certain about it. And there's plenty of room to grow. Only 35 out of every 1,000 cars sold in Canada now is an EV. Electric vehicles are very different, and it can take years for an automaker to build new supply chains. The batteries, for instance, are in high demand. And it all impacts how many cars are even available to send to dealerships. Makes it hard to sell them. Just ask John Yaden at this Hyundai dealership. It's tough as a consumer to walk in and say, hey, do you have one of these? Can I test drive it? Can I see the different options? And can I even buy this? That's, uh, that's not really easy right now. The orders that are being taken are booking for June and July of 2020. But you got to get that supply chain up and running. Right. There is a huge demand for this in, uh, in North America, and keeping up with that is the hard part. If it's a big shift for dealerships, imagine the change for automakers. John Axon of Simon Fraser University has been following their supply trends. You know, it's an it's a industry that's quite comfortable with the gasoline-powered vehicles that it's been selling, and that's where it, and most of its patents and its, and its investment over many, many decades is. And so, you know, it's a hard sell for that, those kind of companies to make a huge investment into a brand new technology that's very different than what they know. Uh, without having some certainty that that is going to be the future. The Steel Auto Group in Atlantic Canada is embracing that future. It owns 40 dealerships, four of them neighbors on this Halifax street. They're betting on electric and want to lead everyone else. Electric vehicles are the way of the future, so... You want to be on the leading edge of it. Absolutely. That means significant costs up front. Installing fast chargers, training sales staff, mechanics. Really, there's not a whole lot of moving parts, like in an electric motor and stuff, there's way less to really go wrong. 
not good when many dealerships make more money on service than selling actual cars. It's going to mean a big shift in their business model. If you think about the Genius Bar at Apple, yeah. where you have more of a software updates approach to, to service, um, it does change the model. Like a lot more is going to be more on electronic fixes mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to. Does know, that worry you? I mean, that, all changes. that's a business risk. It's a business risk. It's a change yeah. in the in the way cars are going to be sold, service, and that's you know, and that's going to take time and it takes adaptation, which is why we want to get in early in the game as an auto group so that we're we already have all that ironed out. And some would like to see that change forced now. Do what Quebec has done, for instance. 43% of Canada's EVs are in Quebec, while Nova Scotia has only 0.2% of the country's electric vehicles. Rebates are part of the reason why, but so is the law. One Quebec and a bunch of US states already have, and BC just added. It's called a ZEV mandate for zero emission vehicle. The ZEV mandate insists through legislation that automakers sell a minimum percentage of electric vehicles. If Canada nationwide adopted the same policy that British Columbia just put into place, that alone, I'm very confident, would have the, the strongest impact increasing electric vehicle sales, not just in the next couple of years, but in the decades to come. In fact, he says, ZEV mandates are proven to get people buying even more effectively than rebates. It is a policy meant to stimulate innovation. Currently, without a strong signal to, to the automakers, to their supply chains, and to everyone in that, on that side, on the supply side, there's not really enough incentive to make big investments in making the vehicles or in selling them. Nova Scotia does not have an EV sales mandate, but Mike Curry isn't waiting. Why is it that other dealerships aren't embracing EVs the same way you are? I think a lot of other uh, dealers, maybe they're just waiting until it all comes, but we want to be ahead of it. We want to be the leaders in, uh, in offering electric vehicles, and that's why we're committed as a, uh, as a dealer group to, to make that happen. It may seem like a slow game, but much is happening. Far more models now available, more on the way soon of all shapes and sizes with greater ranges. Just a question now of whether you can find them. David Common, CBC News, Cambridge, Ontario. All right, let's talk a little bit more about this with electric vehicle expert Kenneth Bacor. We saw an awful lot of familiar brands, of course, in David's piece there, Kenneth, but when most people think of EVs, they do still think Tesla. Uh, how is Tesla's business model different than everybody else? Yeah, you know, great question, and thank you for having me on. I mean, Tesla has been a pioneer in the all-electric vehicle marketplace. We have to remember that their business model is solely electric vehicles. So they built their business on that and they've been able to refine their manufacturing, their supply chain, all of the, the necessary business elements to be able to produce uh, EVs and in, in growing quantities. So they, are, they tend to be the leader and a lot of organizations are looking to follow up with that um, and learn from what they've done. Okay, I guess that makes sense. If you're only doing one thing, it's easier yeah. to keep it going. But That's there right. have been uh, lots of other big manufacturers getting on board or indicating that they're going to get on board. How serious are they? You know, a couple of years ago, I might say they're not that serious, but but at this point, they really are. I mean, this year alone has been a, a precedented year in manufacturer growth. Mm -hmm. We have staggering numbers of of dollars that are being put by manufacturers. You know, VW up to a hundred billion dollars Canadian to retool and and rebuild efforts for offering all electrification to uh, what they want to get to is forty percent of their vehicle suite uh, mm -hmm. fleet. Excuse me, by twenty thirty, um, we have Ford, of course, that came out with the the Mustang Mach E, um, and they're investing eleven billion dollars US to electrify more of their platforms. Um, uh, Hyundai as well has said they want to have almost 700,000 vehicles being sold every year by 2025 that are electrified. So these are unprecedented growth numbers, which means that they're starting to take this industry very seriously. So ju just quickly then, Kenneth, is it really a case of uh, demand outp outpacing supply at this stage? Yeah, we're kind of, I believe, in that middle ground, sure. in that a bit of a gap area. I mean, there are some supply chain issues now with some of the battery uh, suppliers, and we're, we're seeing that from some of the manufacturers. Tesla is different because they insource, they've built these partnerships 
relationships over the years, so they have these relationships. But all the other players have to go to a handful of battery manufacturers that are globally situated in order for them to ink contracts and get these, uh, these uh, parts for the electric vehicles. And that growth has been phenomenal, so they are now uh, gearing up so that they can build more plants and increase their production lines to handle uh, future growth. Okay, Kenneth Bokor, I learned a lot. Thank you very much for your time, sir. Glad I could help. Thank you. Tomorrow, we'll look at the environmental issues posed by electric vehicles. The cathode material that helps power the battery is produced from a number of different metals, so things like nickel and cobalt and lithium. While the cars reduce emissions, the batteries that power them create their own problems. And then, what happens when the batteries just aren't any good anymore? Find out tomorrow night on The National. Time for a quick break, but up next, the UK goes to the polls this week with a record number of young people registered to vote. We'll look at what that could mean right after this. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, as Aung San Suu Kyi appears before the International Court of Justice to defend her country against charges of genocide, we discuss the icon's fall from grace. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. In the UK today, Prime Minister Boris Johnson took his campaign to a fish market up north to convince pro-Brexit Labour voters that he can get a deal done. I'm Bristol! Meanwhile, Johnson's main opponent, Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn, was in the southwest talking climate and health care. The UK general election is this Thursday. You'll see Adrian soon from there. And as Renee Filipponi explains, young people could have an awfully big say in who wins. It may be a fake ballot, but the excitement is real for these college students taking part in a mock election. I'm just surprised that so many people came here today because, like, it's clear that young people are passionate. That passion has led to a bump in young people registering to vote. This will be my first general election that I'm able to vote in, yeah, and it's very exciting. Uh, I, I can't wait to do my duty as a citizen. Back door to no deal. At this event, students grill candidates about issues that matter to them. I, I mean, that's just not going to happen. I mean, we've, ne we've never said we're going to privatise the NHS. We, Brexit, the environment NHS, and health care. It's a tough crowd for the Tory candidate. Well, honestly, I have no idea why, because we are the party that, of aspiration, we're the party of meritocracy. <laughs> Polls show nearly 70% of voters who plan to cast a ballot say they will vote for Labour. We've got a really hopeful, you know, outward-looking, positive manifesto that really inspires a lot of young people to vote. But for it to make a difference for Labour, trailing in the polls, this pollster says these voters need to turn up on Thursday. Getting people to agree with something is one thing, but if they're not bored, if they're not uh, particularly excited by it, if they're bored by it, then. Uh, that's not going to get them moving. Yes. <laughs> Despite the rain and wind, Ashley Ridley persists, door knocking, trying to win people over. And you can stand there so your party would accept Abs that. Accept that. That's, what, that's what I stand for. Frustrated by politics here, he decided to run in this election. You're 18 years old. When you show up at the door and they realize you're the candidate and not a volunteer, what kind of reaction do you get? <laughs> I get a very shocked reaction. Uh, Ridley says youth aren't taken uh, seriously uh, enough and their voices young. matter. Uh, they do know what life is like and they also know what it's like being young and, and a lot of parliament don't represent the young people's view. So all the young people come out. And first time and candidates old. and first time voters, all taking part in an election that will shape the UK that. their generation will live in. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Lansing, England. Have to take a quick break, but when we come back, our moment, how this runner caught an incredible sight on video at Lake Louise. One modern family travels back in time to experience six decades of winter for some good cold fashion fun. So travel through time with the fashion, food, and family fun. Back in time for winter, new season, January on CBC and CBC Gem. This Calgary man was out for a run at Lake Louise when he caught an incredible sight on camera. He's doing a running challenge for the month of December. So he pulled out his phone to capture his beautiful surroundings to share with his running group. And what he caught on camera instead is our moment of the day. 
all of a sudden I just turned to my left and there's this wall of snow coming towards me. Wow. <laughs> Here it goes. I don't think it's coming this far. Right where I was, the chance of me being injured in that situation, if I had a panicked and like freaked out in that as it was approaching and maybe have a heart attack, that could possibly be a danger there. I was on the shoreline of the lake, so up slightly, a little bit higher. So I, my, my reaction simply was, oh, this is really cool. That's crazy. <sighs> it was very nerve wracking and you know, it was just oh. the realization that things can happen so quickly out there. Um, yeah, I, I, was, I was definitely scared there for a few moments. Wild. And just a few seconds after that video, everything was just back to normal. Silence and beauty of nature. So what Brian didn't mention is that there were signs saying that he was in a risky area, but that it was well-trod. People had been there before. What I like about Brian is that he said if he had panicked, he might not have made it. The rest of us would have panicked. But Brian, he just ran, and he ran fast. Thanks for that, Brian. And that is The National for December 9th. Have a good night, everyone.